guys, it's Claire. Welcome back. Today I wanted to talk about two novels I read recently. The first is Asymmetry by Lisa Halliday, and the second is Outline by Rachel Cusk. And the reason I wanted to talk about these two books side by side is that they are books that were both published in the last few years to great critical acclaim. They both seem to be darlings of that kind of literary, intellectual set that falls over themselves for books about writing or, you know, novels that talk about the deconstruction of the novel. And that's one of the main reasons I was avoiding both of these books, but perhaps unfairly, because I found them both to be very interesting reads, and I am, in fact, here to talk to you about how they both deconstruct the conventional novel and kind of push against the constraints of traditional fiction in really new and surprising ways. So I wanted to start by talking about asymmetry, because I think it is the book that at first blush offers the more traditional and coherent narrative of the two. This novel is composed of two disparate stories followed by a brief coda, and the first section opens on a young 20-something woman named Alice who is living in New York City in the early aughts and working as an editorial assistant when she meets Ezra Blazer, who is a very famous, acclaimed, Pulitzer Prize winning writer, some 40 years her senior, and he offers her a Mr. Softy ice cream cone, and thus begins a May-December romance that, as many publications have noted, would seem to mirror the relationship that Lisa Halliday had with the late Philip Roth. And Halliday creates a portrait of a relationship that is asymmetrical in all the ways that you would expect. Asymmetrical in terms of wealth and power, asymmetrical in terms of worldliness and experience, but it's also asymmetrical in terms of physical health and orientation towards time. Ezra can look back on a past that is full of accomplishments and acclaim, but Alice has the freedom to look towards an unwritten future full of possibilities and opportunities yet unknown. And the chasm between the life that Ezra has already lived and the life that Alice has yet to experience is underscored by the fact that although this book is told from Alice's perspective in the close third person, Ezra is a much sharper and more clearly defined character. His voice resonates in all of its at times playful and at times patronizing tones, and you really get a full color picture of this virile but aging literary giant. Alice, in contrast, is like a Polaroid still coming into focus, and her consciousness is a shallow pool that Lisa Halliday just barely skims the surface of. And in place of deeper introspection, we get a lot of dialogue and a lot of images of the things that Alice is observing, and we sometimes even get long passages from the books that Ezra has told her to read. So in many ways Alice does read like an empty vessel, but she is also actively filling herself with all kinds of information, and at one point after an encounter with a local hot dog seller, she does wonder, quote, whether a former choir girl from Massachusetts might be capable of conjuring the consciousness of a Muslim man, which is one of the earliest hints in this book that Alice perhaps contains greater depths and more multitudes than we initially expect. But before we get a sense of where any of Alice's ideas may lead, Asymmetry takes a sharp turn and seems to hit the reset button, opening its second section on an Iraqi-American man named Amar who's being detained at Heathrow Airport. And beyond just that abrupt shift in narrators and setting, what is most jarring about this narrative jump is the sudden deepening of the writing style and the prose. After kind of coasting along the the flat plane of Alice's consciousness, opening this section feels like falling off a cliff into the canyon that is Amar's mind, with all of its various echoes and philosophical reverberations. Written in the first person, this section of asymmetry is so much richer and more interesting and more dynamic than the first section, both in terms of just 
the language and also on a more intellectual and existential level. Because although Amar is trapped in the bowels of Heathrow, his mind is in a constant tumult, circling back on all of his various memories of growing up in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, or of his relationship with his college girlfriend, or of past visits to family in Iraq. And sprinkled throughout all of his recollections and his time at Heathrow, there are these small breadcrumbs and details that recall moments from the first section of the book. And much has been made of the subtle and at times elusive connection between Alice and Amara's stories. And I hesitate to call it a spoiler because I really think it is the essential key that binds this whole book together. But if you don't want to know what it is, I recommend that you stop watching now. Essentially, as you read Amar's story, it becomes increasingly apparent that this is actually a story that has been written by Alice sometime after her affair with Ezra. This is confirmed in the book's coda, which I actually think is kind of unnecessary and heavy-handed, but reading these two disparate stories with the knowledge that they have been channeled through a single consciousness really opens the door to all of the questions about fiction and authenticity and identity that Lisa Halliday is pondering in this book. And above all, with the juxtaposition of these two stories, Halliday seems to be testing and exploring the imaginative capacities and the limitations of one person's subjectivity. And in doing so, she's engaging with debates that are happening today about the power and purpose of fiction, about what an author's relationship with their subject matter should be, and about what qualifies as authenticity in fiction or literature. And so it's no mistake that she opens this book with a story that so closely mirrors her own experiences as a young woman. And in doing so, she is in a way playing into the current literary trends that favor the personal and the confessional and the authority of what is increasingly being called autofiction. And yet she undercuts that sense of authenticity authenticity when in Amar's section he wonders why we grant so much authority to memory when memories in many ways are just as fallible and malleable as fiction and kind of just another way that we craft stories about our lives. And in direct contrast to Alice we have Amar who in many ways by today's standards neither Alice nor Lisa Halliday is really qualified to speak for and yet on the page he is is a much richer and more dynamic character than Alice. Although, of course, his consciousness is supposedly Alice's as well. And in that way, Halliday seems to be making an argument for fiction as a means by which one person can expand and multiply their lives and experiences and worlds. And she seems to argue that the human consciousness is much more expansive and mutable than we might give it credit for. And yet she is also quick to acknowledge that fiction and invention do ultimately have their limitations. Even someone who imagines for a living is forever bound by the ultimate constraint. She can hold her mirror up to whatever subject she chooses at whatever angle she likes. She can even hold it such that she herself remains outside its frame, the better to de-narcissize the view. But there's no getting around the fact that she's always the one holding the mirror. And just because you can't see yourself in a reflection doesn't mean no one can. So in that way, Halliday is quite self-aware as she explores all of these ideas. And it's also important to note that Alice's section of the book is called Folly. And it's worth considering whether there is a certain folly and irresponsibility to a choir girl from Massachusetts trying to imagine what it's like to be torn between two countries and two cultures. And so I think in that way, Halliday is approaching all of these questions about who has the right to tell what stories in a rather thoughtful way. But while this book raises so many questions that are worth wrestling with, it also does feel like a book that is far more invested in those concepts and ideas than in its characters or in emotional payoff. And maybe that's okay. Maybe it's okay for a book to be less of an emotionally satisfying, self-contained, traditional narrative, and more of an interesting contribution to 
broader conversations that are happening outside the text. Which leads me into Outline by Rachel Cusk, which is even more resistant to conventional storytelling than asymmetry is, because in so many ways, Outline is itself a rebuke of narrative entirely. It follows a woman who is traveling to Athens to teach a writing workshop, and it is largely comprised of the conversations she has with friends and students and the strangers she encounters along the way. But those conversations, more often than not, read almost like monologues unspooling from the minds of the various actors in each scene. And because of that, this book has a very loose and liquid feel, flowing from one idea to the next without much of a structure or framework to any of it. Even our protagonist feels quite translucent and difficult to grab hold of. Like Alice, she spends much of this book listening and observing in a state of passivity and what she calls a life as unmarked by self-will as possible. And although we learn very little about her, we don't even know that her name is Faye until quite late in the book, along the way we do pick up on the fact that that she is a writer from London who has a young child or children and whose marriage seems to have recently ended. And outside that established script of family and marriage and motherhood and love, our narrator feels quite adrift, living in this state of kind of post-narrative existence. The irony of this is that so many of the people she encounters throughout this book are actively trying to build and construct narratives about their lives, whether consciously or not. Many of the conversations that fill this book concern family and love and relationships, and various characters wonder whether it's a relationship that provides your life a sense of structure and a sense of a real and shared story. Some people wonder whether a life without love is a life without a story, and like Amar, they sometimes wonder how reliable and authentic our memories are, or whether memory is just an amalgamation of all the things that you've seen and heard and experienced and imagined. And although both Faye and Rachel Cusk seem very suspicious of narrative, the temptation to narrativize our lives and the lives of others is ever present. While in Athens, Faye is staying at the apartment of another writer and she finds herself going through the rooms looking for what she calls a clue, something rotting or bleeding, a layer of mystery or chaos or shame as if the objects and debris of our lives can somehow tell us something definitive about a person. And there is a certain power in being able to give yourself a story through which to understand your own life, but there's also a certain peril in it as well. At one point, a playwright describes feeling paralyzed by the idea that to write about something is to sum it up, the idea that all of her plays can be summed up in a single word, like tension or jealousy. And so in that sense, while writing and narrative can sometimes be clarifying and empowering, sometimes it can also feel quite limiting and reductive. And what Cusk seems to be exploring in this book is what it's like to let go of one's grasp on narrative and to give into a certain lack of clarity and cohesion. Towards the end of the book, she says, he was describing in other words what she herself was not. In everything he said about himself, she found in her own nature a corresponding negative. This anti-description had made something clear to her by a reverse kind of exposition. She began to see herself as a shape, an outline, with all the detail filled in around it while the shape itself remained blank. Yet this shape, even while its content remained unknown, gave her, for the first time since the incident, a sense of who she now was. And so a rejection of narrative and self-definition brings with it its own kind of empowerment, and it brings a certain liberation from the scripts that narrative demands of us. And this book is ultimately kind of an uneasy read because it does lack that coherence that we usually expect from novels. But it's also so interesting to watch Cusk navigate these questions about writing and narrative within something that is ostensibly a novel. And so despite all of the ways that asymmetry and outline are quite different, they are both deeply interested 
in stretching our understanding of what fiction can and cannot do. And I've always thought of myself as someone who didn't much care for that kind of experimental fiction. I always thought books like that kind of operated on a single intellectual frequency without hitting much of an emotional register. And while I wouldn't say that either of these books are particularly emotionally resonant, both of these books are so compelling and the ideas in them are both so carefully crafted and considered and they've just been rattling around my brain a lot these past few weeks, which is immensely rewarding in its own way. So if any of the things discussed here sound interesting to you, I would recommend checking out these books. And if you have read them or have thoughts about them, I would love to hear them. So please leave them down below. As always, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.